Inheriting genealogy is a big responsibility and it can be a bit overwhelming. Even if you haven't been fortunate enough to receive much from other researchers in your family, chances are the descendants that you have are going to be faced with inheriting your research. And that's why this week's episode of Elevens is with Lisa is for everyone. This is episode 74. As exciting as it can be to receive some new genealogical information, it can present a few challenges. Things like figuring out which piece of information is actually correct, um, finding a way to process it and blend it into what you already have, or if you're new to genealogy, what you don't already have. And you got to find a place for it. And there might be a few hard decisions to make about what you can't keep. Well, this is Elevens is with Lisa. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. I hope you just take a big breath, grab, how about some chamomile tea today? And we're just going to sit back and relax and face this challenge head on. We're going to do it in a methodical way that um, is going to make it a little bit easier, maybe a little bit more enjoyable. And um, I think we should just jump right in and let's start talking about inherited genealogy. So, okay, I have inherited genealogy from somebody in my family. Yay for me, but now what? I know, uh, I've gotten this email several times from different people. And I know it is on people's minds. Um, Jim wrote me an email not too long ago, a couple months ago. And he says, I'm going through my family tree. And I have a question. My aunt spent a lot of time back in about 1985 and had a huge hardback book of printed up uh, on the family history, on, on the family tree. But I was told by a few family members that some of the information in it isn't true, <laughs> which is possible. How do I go about doing my own research and properly compare the information? I need to figure out what is right and what is wrong. This is fun, but frustrating at the same time. Thanks. Well, that's just one book, right? I mean, how nice to get a compiled history like that. Um, And that can pose its own challenges. Sometimes we get even more stuff than that. The most important thing, and I think Jim alluded to this in his email, is don't take it at face value. (laughs) So accuracy is really one of the biggest concerns that we have when we are lucky enough to have somebody drop off a book or a box or a truckload full of stuff. And we have to kind of figure out what they've been doing and if they did it properly, especially if this researcher who's being generous with you, didn't cite their sources. Not everybody even learns about source citation when they get busy uh, and learn how to do genealogy. They might just be doing it as a hobby. They feel like, hey, this is fun, this is for me. And you don't really worry about it, but it's something to consider, particularly now that you're inheriting that research. There's no way to know if an ancestor on their tree is truly your ancestor until you look at the genealogical source documents for yourself. So you are gonna have a bit of work to do on your own to uh, take all this information in and do it wisely. Now, if they haven't listed their sources for each piece of information that they've included, um, then we have to go and find those sources. And the good news is, like in the case of the book that Jim got from his aunt, there's probably birth, marriage, and death dates at a minimum listed for each person. And hopefully there's a couple of locations, you know, like they were born in this state or this town. So you already have a lot more to go on to be able to track this stuff down. It's not going to be as hard as just starting with a completely blank slate. So the good news is that process of finding the records and verifying the information should go a lot quicker. And if you can't find it, then you might know there's a problem. So the process always remains the same. Even when somebody hands you what looks like a finished genealogy, you still have to start with yourself and work backwards. That's really how all of us do genealogy from the very beginning. We 
write ourselves down and we figure out who our parents are and our grandparents and we go from there. So when you pick up a book like this, uh, it can be really tempting to uh, jump back to some interesting ancestor that you've never seen before and, and start there. But let's take a moment, go back to the beginning when you first inherit that genealogy research, we know we've got to go do some research ourselves to verify it. What are we going to do first? Okay, so Jim inherited a single book, but you might be lucky enough to have gotten a truckload full of stuff or maybe a big cardboard box. I've, through the years, I literally have received all of it. I have had everything from a single book that my great aunt gave me to, um, an entire truckload full of stuff I brought home after my grandmother's funeral to a cardboard box that my uncle had brought over to the house one day and uh, left on a footstool in my living room. And I walked in and went, oh, yay, right? I mean, they, they're all cause for a genealogy happy dance. Well, what are we going to do with this stuff? Before we just kind of jump in, I think one of the best things that you can do is try to divide the information by families. So there might be um, info coming to you where a lot of it is your direct line, but then there are some people who've married in and depending on who gave it to you. In the case of Jim, he got it from his aunt. So she may have stuff on her husband, uh, other families that don't really impact his family tree, or at least are not a, a huge priority for him. So I like to take a moment and kind of divide it up into families. And this photograph is just one example of somebody receiving a whole lot of genealogy and it comes in all shapes and forms and levels of organization, right? So what I like to do is I place each pile that I've created and, you know, I sit down at the big table and kind of put it into the, the piles by families and then get those into clear stackable bins. So I've got, actually, I don't know if you can see these on the camera. Can you see these? Oh, these are my, my bins. Um, I have lots of these. Uh, the, I like if I can possibly get it into the small one, yay for me, but I do have the larger size as well. And what I'm doing is I'm putting this each pile into a bin and I'm trying to hopefully take a moment and get it into as much chronological order as I can. Now that's not going to be perfect. Perfect is just going to have to be set aside quietly for a while because, you know, we're going to do the best we can and we have to do it within the amount of time that we have available in the space. So we're going to try to just, you know, glance at it, get things kind of in order. If, if there are some dates on things, great. We, we know generally speaking what chronological order we can put it in. But we need to then quickly label the box before we, get, we lose track. Now, on these small boxes, I had just a simple label in a Word document and I would just go back in and retype every time uh, who it was. I rather than, I mean, I have the surname, but I like to put who it came from too. So I have that this is Pauline Moore. This is my uh, paternal grandmother. And uh, so I have several different small boxes here, photographs and negatives, uh, knickknacks, keys, handkerchiefs, keepsakes, books, documents, and then you can tape this on the outside. When I cut it, then I took just a piece of scotch tape and put it on either side. It's fine because we're gonna set it in a closet and we're not gonna be messing with it all the time. So it's not like it has to be a big formal thing and I wouldn't put a sticker on here. My hope is I'm gonna absorb all of this and I'm gonna get it put into another place and I get to use this box for something else. Maybe to organize my other closets, which would be really nice. Um, I also have, the bigger boxes you can see here Doo -doo -doo -doo. and what I did with this you could get a three by five uh you know like a, a little three by five card and get a, a medium sh black sharpie pen and you could write on it um the name uh I in this box I just did a, a sticky note Lisa Cook grade school through high school that's what all that stuff is yes oh my gosh See, I'm going to get sidetracked. I've got little journals and diaries from when I was like in, this is second, first grade, second grade. Autograph books. Oh, all kinds of stuff. Oh, yay. Girl Scout batches. <laughs> I digress. Okay, so, but the nice thing about this is if you put this on a sticky note or a three by five card, 
just set it inside the end of the box. And because these boxes are clear, they show right through. You don't have to tape anything and you can always take it out. Um, you know, my, again, my hope is always I'm going to get through this stuff and then I'm going to be able to use these boxes to organize other things. And I love that the lids are super stackable. Okay. So they have a little ridge inside. That makes it just a huge difference. And they're snap on, snap off. I recently got some bins where you had to like take the handles and do them off and put them on. Oh my gosh, I like broke a fingernail the first time I did it. And it was just painful. So I just like the snap on, snap off. Again, we're not going in and out of these for the next 50 years. We're, we're just trying to kind of get things sorted out. So you also need a place to put your stuff. And you can see a picture here of just a part of my spare bedroom closet. And this is where I'm going to store my bins. And the nice thing about this is that these are, it's a room that when I close the door, it's dark. It kind of looks like there's a, what do you call it? The ceiling? A skylight. It looks like there's a skylight. There's not. It's just a light in there. Um, but I have a couple of shelves where I can stack scrapbooks. Um, I can stack bins. Okay, so now I know some of you might be thinking, oh, Lisa, I can't believe you're using these plastic bins. What are you doing? It's not archival safe. Oh. Okay, let me tell you, I've been using these for probably 25 to 30 years. And I can tell you that more important than super archival safe and all that, and those are really expensive boxes, is that it's in a temperature stable room, it's dark, and I'm not disturbing them. <laughs> I have opened these boxes and everything looks exactly the way I put it in there when I got it. Some of the stuff I've had a long time, some of it, a lot of it is just a recent project I've been working on. So again, the goal is not that it's going to sit in there for 25 years. The goal is that we're going to divide it up, keep it clean, keep it protected from dust with a snap on lid, keep it protected from the light so it's not shining through the box and um, discoloring anything. And we're also trying to keep it temperature stable, which is around 72 degrees in our house. You accomplish those things, the box is going to be fine. And it certainly has been for me. If you want to go and spend $30 a box, you can. I can't afford that. So it's really nice to be able to uh, head to Target, grab some of these, and they're on sale, and be able to use them. And like I said, my goal is that I'm going to fill these up, start it you know, sorting things out by family, and I'm going to be able to go back in and pull these out and work on them one by one. So a spare closet works great, um, even under your bed, which I've done that before too. You just make sure you measure before you go to the store to buy your bins, but that can work in too. Then the important thing to me is that everything is undisturbed and easily accessible and most importantly, all in one place. So for in my early days, when I was, you know, younger and had three kids in the house and, you know, all kinds of things going on, I would kind of end up, I might box a few things up, but I end up scattering it in different places. And I tell you, even now I still come across things. I think, what is that doing here? So I, I know I'm probably the only person that happens to, but you know, you can end up with things kind of scattered and so then a project gets kind of thrown off because you're like, oh no, I'm missing this whole piece. So having it all together is really important. You're trying to carve out enough space to make that possible. And certainly this closet has worked out really well for me. And now in the evening, you know, Bill and I might sit down and watch a movie and I will pull out one single box and put it on my lap and kind of start going through it. Now, some of these things are just knickknacky things and other things it's actually genealogical research it's papers and stuff i have lots of knickknacky things so i've been kind of going through um the, those kinds of things on my lap in the evening and kind of keeping track and creating a spreadsheet of who i want to give some of these things to and where they came from and what i remember about them um, so we have the physical stuff and we have the genealogical information stuff. I'm going to focus today on genealogical information, but I very much would like to do another episode on just the physical stuff. I had a comment this morning 
on the show notes page for this episode asking for just that. And I think it's a fabulous uh, request. And so we need to do that. So, okay, you've got a place to put your stuff. You've divided it up. Now, if what you inherited is binders, books, that kind of thing, things that have already been somewhat organized, maybe a scrapbook, the important thing is to don't take those apart. So what I got, a lot of my stuff came to me in big cardboard boxes where somebody just threw everything in. So the dividing and conquering process works really well. But for the scrapbooks and things I got, when I first started getting them, um, and the word gets out, you're a family historian, that tends to happen. Um, I would think, oh, I need to protect these and and they don't seem very safe and protected in this scrapbook. It's not archival safe. And I found that I could actually do more damage by taking things out. I have ripped more than one picture um, in my years and you lose the context. That's the most important part. Whoever put it in that book knew something about the pictures, knew something about the stories, and they probably had some type of context. So, um, don't do that. Re- kind of resist the urge to pull everything apart. Rather, as you saw in my closet, I just found, I made sure I had some shelves and I got those scrapbooks lined up and I tried to kind of put them in there basically in chronological order. So when I'm ready to deal with that decade or that time frame, I can go and pull that as well as a box. So there's definitely something to be learned from the order in which things are put into books. So make sure we try to our best to retain that. Okay, so we need to take inventory and prepare to track your progress because the truth is you're not going to get all this done in one sitting, most likely. And fingers crossed, somebody else is going to come along next week and maybe bring you some more stuff from the other side of the family. So this could be an ongoing thing. It has absolutely been ongoing for me. And so I needed a way to um, make sure that I had a process for tracking kind of where I'm at in my project. Because as you know, sometimes you do it daily, 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 and then all of a sudden it's two months before you get back to it because life gets in the way. So if you set up, a pro- set up a process that makes it easy to pick up the project and put it down while keeping track of where you left off, you're going to be in really good shape and you're going to avoid duplication. So there's a couple of different ways that you can track your progress. Um, you might want to create a spreadsheet. Now, Bill is the king of spreadsheets and I am not you know, I've never even bounced check a checkbook before in my life. So I, I don't know much about accounting or anything. And but so I really steered clear of spreadsheets. But then as I got further and further into genealogy, I realized these are super helpful. And, and he would show me kind of how simple they were to kind of set up. So I really like using um, spreadsheets as research logs and project logs. But you could do a Word document, you could use Evernote or OneNote, we talked about that in episode 70. So create a note and just keep track from there. They, they're adding some features like you can throw tables in there and all kinds of stuff. So it's very possible. You can also make checklists. You could have a simple spiral notebook, just something that's going to stay with your project that you know, you grab a bin, you grab your log, and you get back to exactly where you left off. That's the idea. So as I said, I use Excel spreadsheets to track my progress in my project and to know what I've already done, what I have not. Um, I like them because uh, I learned how to make tabs a couple of years ago and boy, did that change my life. So it's not just the one screen when you turn, when you open up Excel, you really can create many different tabs along the bottom, each one being their own worksheet. So if I inherit a book and I got a couple of scrapbooks, I have a computer disk I need to go through, I have an, a, one of those pop-up address books, I got one of those for my grandmother. Um, each one of those has a tab so that I can just tackle that item and be able to track kind of what I'm getting done. So tabs make that really simple. And the nice thing is your spreadsheet's going to provide a complete inventory at a glance. If you sat in on my uh, Alice the genealogist and how she avoids falling down the rabbit hole, we talked about uh, the heirloom worksheet and having almost a binder or a PDF document, something where we're kind of keeping track of all the heirlooms that we have 
and where they came from and photographs of them, well, this Excel spreadsheet could come in super handy to just toss in with that so that, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You're already inventorying things as you're going through your project. So this is going to be wonderful for the people who are going to inherit all this stuff from you too. And it's really easy to add columns to your spreadsheet and you could include um, the type of item it is, what date you're working on it. You could add um, information that it contains, notes that you want to make, all that kind of stuff. So um, sometimes I find that on different tabs for different items, I have different columns. So do what works for you. Okay, there's no hard and fast rules. There's nobody's gonna come along and say you're doing it wrong. Right? Okay, so you've already kind of dealt initially with the physical stuff. And you really are set up for success at this point. So now you got to get yourself a genealogy software program. This is a must have whether you're new or you're to genealogy or you, you're experienced. I just did a presentation um, in Wichita, Kansas, and I always ask the question uh, at the seminars, you know, raise your hand if you have a database. I was floored how few people do. This is really changing because of the internet. It's influencing us as researchers and uh, we see, oh, it's so simple to put your tree online. I'm just gonna toss it up there. Well, now you've kind of put it totally under somebody else's control. So a software database fixes that. It helps you, one, stay organized. It's also going to give you a mechanism for consistently adding your source citations as you're working through your inherited genealogy. So a database is going to prompt you. It's going to say, you have a spot here to put. What's the source? Where'd you get this? And that's key. So if you're just putting stuff on online trees, you don't always have that. You might link a record that you have found, but if you're adding data yourself, it's really easy. I've seen so many trees where they don't source anything. A database on your computer is going to serve as kind of the brain of the operations. Okay, so and we talked about this in my um, data workflow session that we did a, a video a couple of weeks ago. That's here at the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. The idea being that we do have stuff in a lot of different places. We've got bookshelves, we've got boxes, we've got closets, we've got, you know, physical items hanging on the wall. So when I have a question about something in my family tree. I know where I go. I go to my database. That's where everything has been entered. And it's going to prompt me where I got it from, the source citation, and where is it? <laughs> where is it in my house? I like to make notes about where things are being stored. So I know that then, okay, now I'm going to go look in Evernote. Now I'm going to go in the closet. Now I'm going to go over on the shelves. And the, the database is kind of command central for everything that's going on in your family history. And it puts it all in your control on your computer. So if next Tuesday, some genealogy website says, ah, we're going to sell to somebody else, or we're going out of business, or we've decided to change our, our business model, you don't have to scramble. You don't have to worry that that announcement went into your spam folder and you never heard about it. You're going to have all the important stuff in control on your own computer. Now, there's several different programs, and since I know Still, many of you probably don't have some kind of a database. Um, here are some of the ones you can buy. There's even a free one. So Family Tree Maker, Legacy, and Ritz Magic, they're all, I think, the most popular ones. I don't think you can really go wrong with any of them. You might want to test drive them with a trial and just see, does this kind of work for your brain? Does this seem to, to work well? You like the interface of it? And there is an absolutely free one that you can download yourself. At My Heritage. Uh, you can download the Family Tree Builder. So see the show notes. This is uh, episode 74. And over at genealogygems.com under 11s, you are going to find this is episode 74. All the show notes are there, everything we're talking about and links. And of course, we so appreciate when you use our links. When you if you pick one, uh, you're going to make sure you're going to get it downloaded and install it on your computer. And then you'll be good to go. But the next step, of course, and the most important step is that you get some kind of automatic cloud backup on your computer. If something happens to your computer, your laptop, whatever, you want to be able to restore all your files 
And certainly that includes your genealogy files. So I use Backplace. Um, whatever one you decide, just make that a priority. When you get that database on your computer, get that back up. You're going to be so happy you did because there's going to be other stuff on your computer that you want to protect as well. And uh, you can go check that out as well, backblaze.com slash Lisa. Uh, if we're going to keep moving because there's so much to cover just in this session together, but I wanted to let you know if you want to learn more, I would really encourage you to go watch some of my video classes on databases and organizing. Lots and lots of specific information there, how to's, how I set up my stuff. And uh, we have a really nice kind of growing collection of the premium videos. So if you're a premium member, you've got access to watch all those and look for the link on every video page on every class page. There's a downloadable link for the handout as well. Okay, so now the fun part starts because we get to really start processing the information that has come into our possession. Start by entering that information that you inherited, um, starting with yourself. Remember we said it's really tempting to kind of jump back to some interesting ancestor you never heard about before? Well, we're going to start with ourselves, And the reason we're going to do that is we want to make sure that we can prove each relationship as we go back generationally. So if you're just relying on this book that you got from your aunt and you're looking at a three times, you know, great grandfather, you can't be absolutely sure that is your great grandfather until you prove each of those relationships. So that's why we do that. The database is going to give you, um, it's going to help you build that tree out, it's going to show it to you in a pedigree form. And you're going to be able to show how you proved it through your source citations. Because it is tempting. Um, make sure that you know exactly why you believe that person is indeed one of your ancestors. Because really, an accurate family tree is what this is all about, right? It's, it's no fun if it's not true. So Jim would start by turning to the page in his aunt's book that includes him or his closest ancestor, maybe she lists his parents. So you know, when he goes to the book, he may not be on page one. So he's going to have to check the index and kind of see where his line starts in the family uh, compiled history. And on his spreadsheet, he might include columns for um, as he's going through just the single book, the ancestor, he could put in on his spreadsheet, I'm working on this ancestor, it's on this page number and, and put a couple of notes about what he's doing. And because he's going to have to take a moment and not just enter that into the database, but actually wait until he can find the documents to prove that is indeed his ancestor. So he's going to enter information as he works on each person's record. And sometimes the proving part can take more than one sitting at the computer. So the spreadsheet again is going to help you keep on track with that. Now, a compiled history is just one source. It's and it's not even a primary source, right? Because it's compiled after the fact by somebody who didn't necessarily know all of these people personally. And so it's really important that we get additional sources to prove that that information is correct. And that you agree with the conclusion that was come to in the book. Because after all, it is your family tree. So never enter a new ancestor into your family tree without sources. Have I said that enough yet? I think I have. Um, but I only say it because how many times I've heard from people over the years, and I realize that's probably their key problem is that they made some assumptions. I, I had somebody tell me in fact, at the seminar that I just went to, that um, he said, I'm so lucky because somebody else did all the work, and they gave me the book. And I was just like, oh, yeah, but <laughs> did you check it? He thought his work was done. I think his work was just beginning. So if the item, the book that you get, let's say, names somebody, we have to go find the records to prove it. And once I'm satisfied, then I'm going to put them in my database and then I'm going to cite my source. So um, a, a few decades ago, oh my gosh, this was back. Um, I'd been doing family history since I was a kid. I told you guys that. Um, probably around 2000 when Ancestry came out, I really got into it just obsessively. And I still had to kind of hold myself back as I was still raising kids at home. And um, But right around 2000, about that same time frame, I got this book. And um, 
it's the descendants of Daniel Wolf. What I was really excited about was that it included my Burkett family as well, who married into the Wolf family. And it really answered some important questions. This thing is meticulously compiled. It's an amazing thing. Think about when you talk about descendants. You pick one person who was born in 1732 and you get descendants of that person. You're talking a lot of people. Not one single source is listed in this book. (laughs) So as excited as I was, and back then I fully admit I put some of these people in my database and I didn't actually go and find additional records myself. Thankfully, so far, everything has seemed to be accurate. Um, Although there have been some dates, some first names, that kind of stuff that were off. And going back and doing my own research is what really made the difference. So what I did with this book was I found the section that got into my family and then I put, I don't know if you can see, I just put little pencil tick marks next to each person as I verified them. So the thing about this book is that um, it's not an heirloom. This is not the only copy on earth, right? And because it's not sourced and everything, I felt like this is really a working document. I'm going to go ahead and I can put pencil marks. I can always erase them later if I want to. And I set about painstakingly finding sources for every piece of information. And um, particularly if that information was new to me or conflicting. So you're going to see stuff in the materials that you get and you'll have already confirmed that. So you're ahead of the game. But you're going to see stuff that is new or that conflicts with what you've got. And that's the stuff that I'm going to prioritize. And I really focused on direct ancestors first. There's a lot of people in this book. There's a lot of people in my database. And there's only so many hours in the day. So I tended to focus on my direct ancestors and their children, getting those family groups. Um, I didn't research everything. So I didn't necessarily focus on um, collateral lines, right? Or focusing on people that um, it's not really critical in terms of what I what I've already got, I, I, I feel really comfortable about what I've already proven. So I don't have to, you know, worry about that so much. And I did not enter anything into my database that was not research and proven. I kept track of what had not yet been researched as well. And of course, we're doing that in our notebook or spreadsheet or whatever, um, because it was a long job. It took me several years to get all the way through all that stuff. So you might be wondering, did I add everybody eventually listed in this book in my database? Absolutely not. (laughs) There's no time. I, again, focused on direct ancestors and included their children. That was my priority. And really, you'll notice too, if you start putting, if you synchronize your database with an online tree, if you are putting it in a separate online tree and you start putting everybody in there, you're going to get inundated with hints and emails and notifications. And you know what I mean? It can make your head spin. So particularly in my online tree, I do not put everybody, not even everybody who's in my database on my computer. When I get all the core people done and nailed down, then I go back and I might selectively pick some collateral lines I want to work on. And also I might focus on a couple of people who are surrounding an area in my tree that's a little shaky or I'm having some brick wall problems. Um, because oftentimes researching the people and the relatives around that problem could help lead us back to a solution for for the problem about our ancestors. So um, not to say that there isn't value in researching some of these collateral people. You just want to do it selectively because, again, there's only so many hours in the day. Rest assured, there is no right or wrong way to do this. Do what is important to you and um, in the most accurate and methodical way that you can. That's the best advice I can give you. And know that it's a long haul project, particularly if you got a lot of stuff. Um, Don't punish yourself about it. Okay, genealogy is to be fun. So have fun with it and know that 
everything that you get done, yay for you. And everything that you don't get done, oh my gosh, you're leaving a little something for the next genealogist who comes along in your family to have some fun finding. You know, we don't want to rob them of everything, right? So it's okay. So we talked about citing your sources every step of the way. If you talk to a lot of genealogists and people who've been doing this for a while, you're probably going to hear some regrets. I, I think that's probably the most common thing that I hear when I speak at conferences and seminars is people are just like, oh, I can't believe I didn't cite my sources. I didn't know that. Source citations are kind of like an insurance policy. They're not very glamorous or satisfying to invest in, but when you need it, when there's a problem, boy, are you glad you've got them. So what kinds of um, problems come up? When would you need a source citation? Well, no tree is immune from discovering that you have an inconsistency, right? Uh, you look at somebody and you realize, oh, there's no way they could have been married then or they couldn't have had children then. So something has popped up and you go, uh-oh, <laughs> you have to go back and kind of review what you did. Uncovering a new source and you find out it directly contradicts what you've already got. So now you need to be able to go back and compare them and figure out which one looks a little more authoritative and see if you can find more materials that back, back up one or the other. What if you get contacted by another researcher who's challenging something that uh, you posted or you published about your family history? That happens a lot, right? If you have an online family tree, if you're doing a family history blog, I hope you are. Um, every, every time you put something out there, of course, you run the risk that somebody's going to go, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, it's happened to all of us. And you might be right, but you're going to have a lot better case if you have the sources to prove it. So cite your sources. And uh, source citations help answer the questions and prevent time-wasting duplication of effort. Oh, what is more frustrating than going back and working on a project and, and then you track down this record and you finally order it and you realize, oh, I looked at this eight years ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's time wasted and nobody's got enough time. So we've kind of hammered down the importance of source citations. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, join me for episode 60. That's uh, at genealogygems.com. And there's all the complete article that goes with that. And I talked to Gail Blankenon. She, boy, she's really good with source citations and gave some great examples. I think you'll definitely want to check that out. And that's episode 60. So what do you do when you can't keep it all? As painful as it is to say it isn't always possible to keep all the items that come your way. That's just the truth of it. And the reality is shelf space, closet space, that's all at a premium, right? And there's so many things competing for that space. So it's limited. And depending on if you, maybe you're getting to a point where you want to downsize your house. Now it's even more of a burning challenge. Um, and collections can grow almost unmanageable. I, I think I've heard that from my husband, you know, because for so many years, the goal was, uh, send it to me. I'll, I'll take care of it. Yeah, I, I'll work on that. And I've been so excited to be able to look at these things and see them for myself and that kind of thing. And now it's really becoming more of a challenge of, I can't keep all this. And here's the thing. My kids don't want all of it. Can I hear an amen there? <laughs> if you're here in the live show, go in the chat and let me know. Are your kids just beating down your door to get all your stuff or are you getting some resistance? It's, it's a problem. And I can appreciate the kids' concerns because all they know is they have, you know, a house full of kids themselves and they've got a life and a, a career they're building and they've got other things going on. So the idea of taking on more stuff isn't necessarily really attractive. So there's going to be times when... You just can't keep it all. So I think it's our job to, as we're going through this process, see what you can do to reduce it. Reduce it as you work with it. I, I've probably told you this many times before. I'll never remember working for a, a lovely lady named June at a big corporation I worked at when, when Bill and I first got married. And she would always, you know, say, touch it once. 
<laughs> don't pick it up three times and, and not decide what you're going to do with it. You're either going to process it, you're going to throw it away, you're going to file it, but um, don't waste time. And so it really trained me to be far more efficient that when I'm working with an item, now's the time to make some additional decisions about it. And one of those decisions might be is do I really need to keep the physical version of whatever this item is? So strive to digitize all the items that you can that are not precious originals that are not heirlooms that are not Uh, one of a kind available nowhere else. We all have those kinds of items. And those are the things that uh, I've talked about in past episodes that I put into my paper archive system. And that goes into my binders, if they fit in the binder. Um, But you're going to keep those things that are precious. I have my grandmother's original baptism um, certificate in German, you know, I'm not going to toss that. I'm going to probably still digitize it, but I'm not going to toss it. But I had a lot of stuff as I was going through things and things that I've inherited that I realized, oh, this is just a copy of something. And yeah, I actually already have a version or I can get it online and I can download it. So once digitized and recorded into your database, then you can toss those kinds of items. And that's important because you want to be able to make the case to whoever you're passing your stuff on to this is the precious stuff. This is the important stuff there. These things don't, you know, exist anywhere else. And I've really have made the effort to whittle this down. And you can do it. I know you can. In fact, so a lot of these boxes, what happened was the closet I showed you, I wish I had taken a picture of it before I put all the bins in there because it was a total disaster. It was full of, you know, the paper, the boxes that paper come in, reams of paper. Okay, so I had a lot of those kinds of boxes where they're sitting inside the lid and they're open and I just kept putting stuff in there. When I started to divide it out, I realized I've seen this before. I've I've seen this before. (laughs) So I'm going through all these boxes and I realized there's a lot of duplicates. Remember in the 70s and the 80s, it was a big deal. You put your film in to get it, you know, done. It took two weeks. Kids don't even know what that's like, right? (laughs) But I remember waiting two weeks to get the pictures back and they would always give you double prints. Wow, you can give them to all your friends just like Facebook now, I guess. So there were all these duplications. And I found that just by throwing away duplicates and throwing away all the what I call low quality photographs, I had pictures where somebody's half a face or my grandmother's hand is on the lens or Um, you know, somebody was just making a terrible face and I just don't want to do it to them to, to keep that forever and pass it on. Whatever. There's a lot, you know what I'm talking about. It's the pictures you didn't necessarily put in your scrapbooks, right? So you can weed those out. I reduced the entire collection by about a third. I was so proud of myself. And in fact, Bill kind of freaked out at first because I would throw it all in the garbage and he'd pull the can out and go, what is this? What is this? I'm like, no, trust me. And he's like, oh no, you're right. These, these are all garbage. And it felt so good. I'm telling you, you're going to be happy. You're going to feel good when you get rid of all that stuff. Just just think of it like, would I put this, would I take the time and the energy to put this in a formal scrapbook? If you wouldn't, then probably that photo is not worth it. Okay? So get rid of all those duplicates. Reduce, reduce, reduce where you can. And ultimately, donation is an excellent option. If you can't keep it all, digitize, take photographs of items. Your phone is a really fast digitizer if you want to do that. And then you can donate your stuff to a library, an archive, a genealogical society, any kind of organization that would be interested in the history of that item. And sometimes you'll find that repositories aren't really focused on your family lines, but they're really interested in the fact that that family was from this place. So the history of a location could be really a desirable thing. And the fact that you have a piece of that location's history. Uh, One woman at the seminar that I did in Wichita, Kansas, told me that um, she approached 
the local archive and she was showing them some stuff and they got super excited and she's like oh awesome they want my family and she's like and they're like no you have photos of a historic building that no longer exists and we've been trying to find pictures of this thing to make it part of another project I think they were doing a, a big display or something about the history of the, of the area and they had no really good photographs of this thing she had it so you never know what a blessing your materials are going to be in a variety of ways that didn't occur to you, but that would be really meaningful to somebody else. I mean, it's like one man's junk is another man's treasure. So you never know. Donation is always something that is um, a wonderful way to help somebody else out. And another wonderful place to do that would be the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library. We talked about that in episode 31, and Allison Singleton was here and told us all about their amazing program. They will digitize stuff for free. You can send them stuff. They, they will take old family Bibles. Uh, really cool. And that way you know that this is one of the largest li genealogy libraries in the country. If another genealogist 30 years from now is looking through your family history, this is very much one of the places they're going to go. So having it in a place that would be very obvious to go look is a really good thing. In fact, I just got an email last night from Hal Horrocks over at the uh, Orange County, California Genealogical Society, who I've spoken to in Huntington Beach. I love those folks. He said back in 2017, they started a program called Rescue the Research. And what they do is strive to help their members digitize their stuff and really get this stuff out and available to other people. And if you go and look at their website, you'll see there's all kinds of information Maybe people at some point ended up in Southern California, but they're from all over the place. So I think this is a terrific example. If you're part of a genealogy society, you might take a look at their site and their project, what they're doing, and see, is this something that you could help your members with as well? Donations isn't for everybody. However, sometimes it really is the only option, but don't despair donating your research is bound to elicit a genealogy happy dance in somebody else. And you can learn more about this part of our discussion that really saving your research from destruction, donating it to other people. We did a, an entire episode on that. It's episode 10. This is now part of the premium collection for premium members. And there's a full um, handout, the heirloom tracker that I talked about. I've got um, blank forms that you can download and use. And um, this is just such a really important topic. I think we've got lots and lots of more specific ideas for you in that class. And you can learn more about premium membership over at genealogygems.com. You know, it's been said that you can't take it with you when you leave this earth. But by following these strategies and addressing the reality now, there's one very important thing that you will be leaving behind, and that's the legacy of your family history. One that avoids burdening the next generation while providing a lasting connection between all of the generations of your family tree. And uh, I hope you have found that helpful. I am looking forward to heading over to chat and seeing uh, what our live audience has been doing. Of course, we do this show live on Thursday mornings, 11 a.m. Central. Uh, many people join us after the fact uh, for the video replay, which of course you can leave questions and comments in the comments section down below on the show notes page as well. Um, I'm looking here. Let me go over where I can see if anybody had you guys have just been busy. I, I love that you're, yeah, I got an amen for <laughs> the fact that not everybody wants everything. Uh, John asks, when syncing your software with an online tree like Ancestry, do these sources and artifacts, the photos also sync? That's a really important thing to, um, to ask because not everything does. And in fact, when we export our tree as a JetCom file, which is the universal genealogy file. Not everything does as well. So syncing will do a pretty good job, but no, it does not do necessarily all of the artifacts. It might depend on which site you're using and which program you're using. Get in touch with the, the site where you've got your online tree and ask them about that. Probably you could Google it because they'll have a help page for you. I never assume that everything synced perfectly. In fact, I don't sync my tree anymore. So that's my thing. Um, 
my database. That's it. It's, it's what I've got. And uh, I tend to put on kind of more fragmented trees on my online trees, targeting particular research. So I hope that helps. Um, folks are saying that, gosh, they've had snow in already in Idaho and Utah. Well, you guys are, are prime and ready to go to hunker down and do this project, aren't you? <laughs> All right. Oh, Bill says, Bill dropped me a note. Viewers have shelf envy. <laughs> are you... I. I gotta tell you what I gave up to make those shelves available and that closet, oh my gosh. I really had to move some things around. Name of the company, oh, that will scan and digitize the, the stuff. Okay, so in the past I've talked about a company out in Utah that I did my digitizing of some of my really high-end photos. I, they did all of my home movies and that was Larson Digital. And um, I find the link and put it in the show notes because we have a discount page for Larson Digital where you can get special discounts. Um, I think also if you just use the coupon code GEMS over at Larson Digital and it's L-A-R-S-E-N is Larson Digital. Um, all right. Oh, I can't wait to go back and read everything else going on in chat. Let me see if I can spot anything else. Well, you guys probably have, you guys have all kinds of awesome ideas in there. I love it. Okay, I'm going to go back and, and look through that. I might add a few additional items to our show notes page, again, at genealogygems.com a little bit later this afternoon. And um, I wanted to mention to you, really, I wanted to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing to the channel. I noticed this morning that there's a little, my face is in the bottom right hand corner. I hadn't seen that before. And I guess when you click that, you can subscribe, which makes it a little easier, which is nice. I think a week or so ago, it was we hit 20,000 subscribers. And I so appreciate that. I hope you're one of them. You know, the, the nice thing about subscribing, and we're talking subscribing at the YouTube channel is that um, it's free, you just click it, and it's really like bookmarking us. It's like putting us in your favorites list. And it, you have a little library when you log into YouTube, and it's over on the left-hand side on desktop, and you can find us there. So it's really easy to get back to your favorite channels, and I hope we're one of your favorite channels. And also, I, again, mentioned to you that I went to Wichita, Kansas. So that's why there was no live show last week. Um, that was Fabulous. Oh my gosh, we had such a wonderful time. Wonderful folks. Thank you to the folks in Wichita. And so many people showed up. It was so wonderful to see many, many smiling faces and get to hear your stories and get hugs and just say, it's really good to be back. So wonderful to see you all and um, doing lots more um, presentations for the rest of the year and juggling that with with uh, being here on YouTube. I love being able to visit with you each week, no matter where you are. That's really a treat. And um, I hope that you will head to genealogygems.com and check out the show notes for this page. Uh, give us a little thumbs up if you liked it. If you, if you feel a little more inspired, are you inspired to get into the genealogy that you have? And maybe it's not even inherited. Maybe this is just um, a stack that you had somewhere in your office or your desk. I hope that you feel empowered to go take care of it. As we said in the very first episode, I think here at 11's is be brave. All right. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And I will talk to you soon. Bye.